Good morning and welcome to today's FS Club webinar on predictions for the metaverse, spatial and immersive environments. Will they become the next big thing? And if so, numerous questions arise, such as what will the impacts be on media and content? Could big media be bypassed? Will every form of content become fungible, changeable or faked at scale? Could big tech advertising models be challenged by a collision of social media and crypto? Is there a dark side? Could immersive media generated at an individual level be designed to manipulate and condition? And what arguments can be made for new forms of regulation to prevent harm? Will this new form of immersive metaverse based on computation herald a new age of artistic and media creativity, with digital avatars becoming the new social media and spurring an explosive burst of discovery, learning and efficiencies in business, medicine, academia, media and fashion? Alternatively, will the predictions of science fiction dystopia prevail, with every single digital media experience touched by a human every day, full of dark patterns, seeking to manipulate, control or sell. The stakes are very high for the UK, with a large creative workforce of around 1.4 billion. So that's some very heavy topics for a Tuesday morning. Uh, but I am delighted to introduce Ian Dowson to you all. Ian is a regular FS Club speaker and always provides fascinating, unique perspectives. Ian is principal at William Garrity Associates who specialise in the impact of digital innovation on fintech, govtech and Web3 AI. They've been producing original research since 2008. They mentor a number of startups and are the govtech lead for the Scottish govtech cluster. Ian speaks and writes on digital innovation and has presented at Social Media Week, Fintech and Blockchain Week, Fintech for Good and Digital Shortage. He's also given lectures at UCL, Bayes Business School and the Mensa International Conference. Very impressive, Ian. Um, now, before I hand over to you, I'll just give the usual brief housekeeping points. So, um, Charlotte Dorber Ashley, I manage the FS Club at Zen. I'd like to warmly acknowledge our very generous sponsors who enable us to continue to bring you a wide range of thought provoking content across finance, technology, economics, and today a bit of media. As usual, the slides will be available on our website and in the chat box. The session will be recorded and available to watch on our website within 48 hours. And there'll be a 20 minute Q&A session after the presentation. So please use the GoToWebinar chat facility to send your questions in to me, and then I can put them to Ian at the end of his presentation. Now, uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. It's always a very, very great privilege to be able to speak uh, by the webinars at the Financial Services Club. Uh, you do a great job in getting innovation and challenging subjects out there, which, which spurs great debate. So what do we have today? Today, I'm going to speak about predictions that I see it for the metaverse, spatial and immersive environments. Nothing I say is any form of financial advice or endorsement. So who's in Dowson? I had a corporate career, which at its end, I did a lot of corporate development, which took me to Columbus, Ohio, and the Ohioans promptly dispatched me to California, the West Coast of the United States, in order to bring innovation from there to Ohio so that they could then service the uh, uh, US internal markets. Uh, so I thought I knew about innovation and corporate development. I was wrong. In 2008, I found Digital London. 2012, I found FinTech. 2016, GovTech. 2020, Web3. 2022, I was reunited with AI and generative AI, having done some work on it in 1992. And then in 2023, uh, 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 I signed up to help the Scottish GovTech cluster. So prediction one, as always, everything is changing. 
I couldn't understand what Web3 was. So I went back to basics and started off with Turing, Shannon, how the web developed from UCLA, ARPNET, into this massive system of communication. Looked again at Bernard Lee's vague but interesting paper. And of course, I had to go through uh, Chateau's, uh paper. Ian, sorry to interrupt. You're, you're currently not sharing your slides. Um, would you just be able to share them quickly? Oh, the shares are... It's... If you just try sharing your, sharing your screen from the button. Alternatively, ah. I can share them if you like. That yeah. looks like it's coming up now. Yeah, and just go to your presentation. Yeah, okay. Right, so I couldn't understand Web3. Uh, 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 so I went back to first principles. Turing, Shannon, UCLA, ARPNET, uh, uh, Bernard Lee's very uh, vague but interesting paper and Chateau's, uh, uh paper on Bitcoin. And I came to the conclusion that Web3 is likely to be multiple protocols rather than the two protocols of web two being http and tcp ip and the core value added of web3 is protocol interoperability regarding media the green screen will be unable to supply the media demands of seven billion smartphones Everything is merging. All of the components of the metaverse are merging into one. The boundaries are falling apart. And in content, every content is merging into every other content. The old channels of distribution are completely fragmenting. And here's an example of this. Uh, the Last of Us, a game released 10 years ago, has now become uh, 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 a, a streaming uh, 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 success. Immersion, I think, is misunderstood. It is a thing. It actually exists. These pictures come from a nightclub under the flannel shop in Oxford Street. And all four walls are, are lit up by artists' uh, uh, work uh, once a month. And uh, people are invited to go in there and then for an experience. And it really is a different kind of experience. The humans behave differently in this environment. And then you have the explosion of immersive, immersive uh, 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 environments in London. There's probably 30 to 40 different uh, uh, immersive experiences, soon to be joined uh, by Elvis. Music is an immersive uh, uh, experience, uh, Las Vegas sphere. And the immersive experience has even reached as far as the ring cycle. Opera Australia, last December, did an immersive experience of the whole rings, Wagner's ring cycle, uh, facilitated by the brilliant Leah Swartzwich. Um, uh, uh, quite remarkable. And how do humans behave in an immersive environment? They go into this immersive environment and absorb the external stimulus of which there may be a number of dark patterns trying to influence them in one way or the other. They take that experience and immediately insert it into their networks, either social networks, 
uh, uh, personal emails, videos. Uh, it gets exploded throughout the individual's networks. But now everything is becoming synthetic. Humans, media, companies, networks. We're on the threshold of a race of synthetic humans. And you can build your own avatar. That's me. It took me seven minutes to do so. And we have avatars at work, uh, customer service agents. But you also get a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Uh, you can also get social media influencers. And you can speak to Napoleon Bonaparte as well as speaking to Napoleon Solo. However, avatars can be used for serious purposes. This is an example of using an avatar for grade one medical research. The ability to simulate a process outside its normal boundaries is going to be highly valuable within a multiplicity of science and engineering applications. Synthetic media, I think disintermediation of the world's media industry is underway. And what does that mean? That means AI or human generated text to any form of media. And that's now flowing over into generating your own agent to go out there into the web and either communicate or find things for you. And then the second part is on the left, on the right hand side, the feedback loop, your behavior, your sentiment, your precise emotional state is being monitored by big tech and the web. And that will be used in order to generate media which is directly aligned to your mental state. And fraud is now an AI fake. I can only say one thing, this is going to get a lot worse. A British company was defrauded by a fake video call. And you have Stora, the example of a 4K video been generated from five lines of uh, uh, text. And Stora is old hat now. You're virtually getting Hollywood pro produce cinematic quality from text prompts. Something very interesting is happening with digital fashion and luxury. And it might fire up another whole cultural explosion like happened in the 1960s in London. On the Left hand side, you see the 1960s fashion, according to generative AI. And on the right hand side, you see fashion created by a whole global cohort of designers and fashion designers, predominantly ladies who have mastered generative AI, the process of filmmaking, the process of generating digital objects, and they're now developing their own brands and producing physical uh, garments. It's a remarkable achievement. And in London, I had the great privilege of seeing three of these individuals and listening into their stories, Miller, Adriana and Leah remarkably talented individuals who are grasping this opportunity to further their career 
in a completely different way. Big brands want to get into this world. Each box is an NFT which you could have bought. Why are they doing that? Because to build up communities for their brands. And Roblox is an attractor of brands. It has broadly 200 million hours daily eyes on, and that's attracting some of the world's major brands to get in there, occupy part of the metaverse, and to project their brand in a completely different way. So could tech, big tech be heading towards MySpace? At the moment, you give big tech your data, activity, and time. They monetize it. You get nothing. However, if you insert a coin, a token, or a way of monetization, your, your own data, you can then sell it to big tech advertising people who collate data on consumer behavior or people who want to discover you and make them pay for it. And this is happening. Uh, there's one thread, social crypto earnings, and there are other threads which are the architecture for a Web3 AI and entertainment channel, the largest one being Theatre Network. And I think NFTs will start to become more ubiquitous and maybe replace part of the points, rewards, incentives, and fan engagement industries. Here's an example. You can buy the music through an NFT and you can join a network which is specifically targeted at that piece of music so that you can meet with the fans of that particular song. However, this all Web3 is nothing without governance. And there have been some appalling governance failures. Without governance, you have nothing. Your money, what you conceive as value, will be stolen. It took 600 years for banks to understand this. However, every so often, a bank forgets about prudent governance. Silicon Valley Bank is an example. The creative workforces, this is a structural change. It's liable to be painful. However, there are many more new jobs that may appear. Creatives could get more power. Music videos, 30 second adverts, and probably animation are going to be the first sectors impacted by this. But there's a great upskilling in software, data, and integration skills required. And AI-generated content will become a media category on its own. But when you look at the value chain uh, of media, at the moment, it's controlled by big media, and creators are at the bottom of it. And there is the possibility that this could flip round with creatives at the top of the triangle, followed by tech and big media at the bottom. And look at the whole range of new jobs that may be created. And I'll just consider the first two. Every single piece of media that humans have ever created will be heading towards a large language model. That is a massive task will take a tremendous amount of effort. And then you have the prompt engineer, which is a new version of software engineering and creative thinking to get the best out of large language models and then integrate them into an existing media format. And then you can see all of the other kinds of jobs that can be created. However, Metaverse and spatial and immersive environments create a unique series of governance challenges. And I'll just concentrate on the uh, uh, yellow donut. Your emotion and sentiment 
is going to be monitored 24 seven. Behavioralism is going to be applied to these emotions. Neuroscience is also going to be applied to these neuroscience. And then you have the governance challenges of uh, uh, statistical bias generated by AI inference and projection, bias created by system upon system upon system upon system, and then the cultural aspects. Firstly, avatars will generate a new form of behavioralism, and the Web3 social media culture is just starting to emerge. I hear all, all of this very often, clarion calls, this can't be regulated. In 1954, when commercial television was invented, it was regulated and it led to, in 1957, uh, uh, stronger regulation of what advertising could be. And then to think about advertising at the moment, tech, big tech have enormous stores of information down to individual level that is now colliding with computational behavioralism, computational neuroscience, online gamification agents. And I call this whole field computational anthropomorphism. What you get is a highly powerful influencing system, which in the case of behavioralism and neuroscience, free will is taken from the individual. It's a major challenge. And what does computational anthropomorphism do? It gives rise to dopamine. And here's an example from a tremendous book by Anna Lambecki dopamine nation of how social networks generate dopamine in order to create addiction to that activity. And it's not finished yet. Uh, brain computer interfa interfaces are a thing. Very soon your mind will be able to be read. And the Information Commissioner's Office there's a very precedent uh, uh, report on this about the dangers or the challenges of neurotechnology. So in summary, this is a fundamental shift. Demand for content can only be met by automation. Media boundaries are fragmenting and maybe big media's distribution control is weakening. The metaverse is not only about immersion, it's about inversion and the explosion of your experiences through networks. Avatars could become your own personal AI agent. Digital fashion, art and NFT and brands in Roblox may be a door opener to mass adoption. New, these new, new models could challenge the existing big tech business model. And this is one of the reasons why there is such an enormous competitive war between the big tech companies at the moment. They understand this. The creative workforce is a major change, but there are many opportunities. The UK, with its highly integrated theatre, music, TV, film, video, industries, music video industries is very, very well placed because that industry is highly adaptive and hopefully will adapt to the opportunities. There are risks. Everything is now fake. That is an enormous risk. Computational anthropomorphism is a new form of dark pattern influencing you without individuals being aware of it and brain computer interfaces have a complete new form of risk. Thank you for listening to me.
Thank you very much, Jen. Um, that was definitely a uniquely fascinating presentation. Uh, I must laugh. So AI, um, Facebook has been trying to recommend me an AI boyfriend for a while now, and I don't know how I feel about that. Um, <laughs> we've got yep. some great questions. Uh, firstly, uh, Dan Feeney has asked, what's your take on open versus closed sourced LLMs? So Llama versus ChatGPT given um, AI's adoption. Yeah, if you look at the triangle of open AI, Microsoft and now Apple, they're attempting to create a moat uh, to prevent innovation happening anywhere except in their systems. Meta and Google are open sourcing uh, uh, large language models. And to be honest, software which costs billions to actually uh, write and the models which cost many millions to actually create. And they're doing that in order to prevent OpenAI, Microsoft and Apple creating a moat and being the only place that consumers can go to. So it's a competitive war and it's great for the consumer or the software engineer because you can develop unimaginable systems which you could never do individually. Uh, uh, you have access to the code and how to use it. And uh, uh, so I think it's a tremendous on open source is a tremendous entrepreneurial opportunity. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, we've heard a lot about the metaverse and um, blockchain and AI for years now, but could you provide like a definition of Web3 for the layperson? I think to go back to my uh, uh, slide, uh, uh, it's about protocols, having multiple protocols and being able to communicate between the three protocols. Mm -hmm. And the other me media driver, it's about experience, getting an enriched experience. Instead of having a one dimensional screen, you have an interactive environment where you can in, you can look at the products, the service, or the media in a 3D and more immersive way. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. So on that note, um, Chris says Web3 will be nothing without governance but everything you showed probably evolved because there was very little governance. I think the governance question, and I veer from zero, i.e. no governance, to 10, if they do it, put them in jail, uh, is an, um, a highly important challenge. And I concentrate on the vulnerable people in society, the children, the teenagers who are moving from being children into adults, people who have uh, a neurodiversity and may be vulnerable, uh, uh, that vulnerable people, in my own opinion, have to be protected. And one of the major ways to do this is by education and then by strong legal intervention. If big tech can serve an advert in one millionth of a second, it can serve governance around a piece of media being generated, which is highly dangerous. Mm. I, mean, I know we've already had um, cases against brought against Meta for showing um, videos encouraging self harm to young people, resulting in suicide. And then I just recently there've been um, show, studies have shown that TikTok is showing young boys lots more content around violence and misogyny, which is 
really um, rather scary. So God knows what's going to happen when young people are growing up in this metaverse with little um, regulation. But on that sort of um, note, um, Shane has asked, overall, are you optimistic about these technological developments? Will synthetic media be a good thing? I, you can't put it back in the box, first of all. And you've got to be able to use it in a positive manner. That you now can create experiences by using the total sum of human knowledge through large language models and the ability to create new forms of media. Uh, uh, it, it's, we're at a moment very similar to that of the automotive uh, uh, explosion and that of electricity. And it's probably even more that humans for the first time have the ability to make media fungible and to make media personal, personalized. This can be a great benefit, but at the same time, there is the dark side. But again, I veer towards education to teach people how to use this mm. and what are the pitfalls to be avoided, particularly teenagers as they grow from being a child to maturity. That's a very, very vulnerable uh, 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 state for all of our young people to be in. They will find it. They will use it. It will be there on the dark web. But if we can get as many of them into a situation of learning how to manage this and then the big tech systems to apply the power of GPUs to prevent and identify people who are putting themselves in a bad place. Speaking of um, education, Dan has asked, how do we effectively educate young people to adapt to this brave new world? And he said, perhaps starting from the classroom from age four and above, which I guess is probably quite effective because they're going to be using these new technologies at home when they're um, learning, like, you know, so many toddlers now you see with iPads and things. So it's not going to be new to them by the time they start school. <clears throat> you, you teach them how to use it, basically, from a very early age, as you said, uh, uh, so that they become highly familiar of it and they use the positive sides of it. It's a new form of reading and writing, right? And writing can be used for good or bad, but it's much more powerful than that because it communicates directly with the mind mm -hmm. and the spatial awareness, particularly of young people, of, of, of younger children who look at the world in a highly spatial environment. And this can be used for good the concept of anthropomorphism can be used for medical interventions to is being used for medical interventions in order to uh, uh, rectify speech defects. The medical applications are all subject to clinical trials and they're produced by uh, uh, physicians and researchers who have ethical values. And it's bringing those kind of values into the broader, A, for broader discussion, and then B, actually into the schools, uh, 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 into the nightclubs, and into uh, the universities, and into life generally. Mm. And I guess that's a good point about education, it needs to also be at home and the classroom, yep. et cetera. Um, v has asked, is strong policing on the co of the contents on social media platforms and in the metaverse, is that the way to go? I, 
I think for the really bad things, the things that you hear about on the dark web, yes. And I go back to the 1954 Television Act, which introduced commercial TV into the United Kingdom. This can be legislated mm. if there is the political will. So each country would have their own separate legislation and policing? I think probably it needs to get near, each country will have its own regulations, mm. right? But then again, I think there needs to be supranational standards, probably through the United Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, the United Nations control telecommunication standards globally, or is a great facilitator of uh, telecommunication standards. And the same thing can be done, where the best practice is always emphasized as the standard practice, mm -hmm. particularly in emerging nations, where there's very few standards. Yeah, and I think you know also if they if these you know companies do um, break you know the laws or regulations, there should be you know really concrete sort of punishments that makes a dent in their giant profits rather than just paying a fine, which seems big to us but really has no effect or disincentive to them. Um, Looking at, Dan's asked uh, quite an important question actually. So he said, in the age of um, megaphone populists such as Trump and Musk, how can the average Joe separate fiction from reality? Well, I think uh, uh, my concept is to say everything you read is fake, first of all. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the evidence and where is the message coming from? Uh, 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 and if the message is coming from powerful academics, right, then uh, uh, that uh, uh, content is liable to have academic validity. If it's coming from populist TV networks, then that has a lower rating mm. of validity. But I don't deny the right of other in, other humans to have different views mm. than I have. Uh, uh, uh. That's a good point. So if we're all a bit, we're all skeptical and we go back to say, who's the source of putting out the information? And then even if it is a trustworthy source, you know, how do you go into the, finding out if it is true or not, what sort of steps do you need to take? Well, now I always start off uh, 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 by using GPT uh, and uh, 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 I'm, I'm a different kind of individual. My whole life has been built on evidence that I can prove. Uh, uh, and I'm highly critical but that doesn't mean to say that I don't dismiss other intellectual arguments, which initially appear to be um, uh, uh, completely opposed to whatever views I've got. You, mm -hmm. you must learn continuously, I think, mm -hmm. and not have... Sorry, continue, continuing. Yeah, no, that's it. I was thinking about that with the um, US presidential debate, debate coming up. I mean, it would be thinking when, you know, say a candidate makes a statement, there should be some sort of fact, check, fact checker there. So if someone makes a statement, one of the candidates makes a statement, does the audience know that, they, that they've just made up something that's not actually true? Or, you know, it should say some, a way for the moderator to convey that information to the audience. But I guess because it's in real time, it's particularly, it's particularly hard. Mm. I think that there are innumerable websites uh, uh, which tells you how fake uh, 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 the assertion is on both p 
political sides uh, uh, and uh, uh, you've you've got to be able to distinguish and form an opinion mm -hmm. And um, V has commented on that saying, unfortunately, there's a group of people who shan't establish news sources, meaning sort of trusted news sources, as demonstrated by um, the Trump supporters in the last US, US election. And obviously, that's a real concern that that will happen again this time. Well, there is the dark side of electoral manipulation. And uh, you have Cambridge Scientifica uh, using Facebook data in order to influence the outcomes of multiple elections. And it is up to governments to be able to legislate, in my own opinion, to prevent this kind of dark pattern manipulation. Mm -hmm. Because when behavioralism and neuroscience becomes combined with massive amounts of data, right, it is such a powerful influencing machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. I think we've got time for one last question. Um, Shane has asked, your um, presentation mentions the um, AROP being defrauded by a deep fake. Um, so doesn't that suggest that even tech savvy individuals are vulnerable to AI, not just children? Yep, absolutely. Uh, 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 in part of my other work, I advocate um, uh, uh, that companies must have a policy on uh, uh, on deep fakes mm. uh, 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 and uh, 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 avoid being caught out. Mm. That you can't trust trust the image on the screen, basically, um, uh, 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 and it's a whole new. Uh, to go back to my accounting dates, internal control mm -hmm. uh, and governance problem, uh, 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 and uh, and that is a, a uh, uh, I think a warning to us all. Yeah, I think all um, staff really need to be trained on not trusting what you see or what you hear on the phone call, and there should be yeah, numerous controls and training built in to prevent that happening at sort of every level, really. Um, but that does bring us to time now. So thank you very much, Jen. It was lovely to catch up and pick your brains again. Um, you've provided a really fascinating presentation that I'm sure most of us will ponder for the rest of the day, um, if not week. Uh, and also thank you to our wonderful sponsors for making these webinars possible. And of course, to our audience uh, for logging in and giving your thoughtful contributions and questions today. Uh, don't forget to check out our forthcoming events on our website. We've got lots more um, coming up, including one about culture and getting kids to care. Um, that's tomorrow, um, sorry, not tomorrow, Thursday, actually. Uh, neuro, we've talked a bit about neuro um, diversity. So we've got neuro inclusive um, leadership and connecting minds tomorrow. And then we've got a walking tour in the city on Friday if you're, if you're around. So thank you very much all and have a great afternoon. And especially thanks to you, Ian. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.